Welcome to today's Google Hangout. I have with me Becky White from Eden Prairie Fire Department, as well as Chief Dave Polikoff from Montgomery County, Maryland. Becky, we'd like to welcome you to the show. And Dave, uh, we'd also like to start by thanking our sponsor, Tincata Fabrics. While Tincata doesn't make gear, especially the fact is they make the liners and the fabrics that go into almost every set of protective clothing that you have out there today. I'm having trouble speaking. Um, I'm sure I'll get over that soon. Becky makes everybody nervous because she talks about presenting things, but you don't have to be nervous if you're wearing Tenkata gear because the fabrics that Tenkata makes make the difference in keeping firefighters safe. So we'd like to thank our sponsor. And we're gonna start off with Becky. Becky, welcome to the show. And one of the reasons I invited you on today was I had the opportunity to take your class at an FDIC a couple years ago, and I was very impressed. And it's one of those classes that we should all attend. So can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and get right into your class? Uh, well, thank you. I'm glad you did attend. Um, my class uh, this year and uh, several years ago when you attended was on um, instructional techniques. So it's not really the sexiest thing to attend at uh, FDIC. Um, but um, by way of what my background is to tell you why I put on this class, I used to be an elementary school teacher, so I have a master's degree in teaching and learning um, and really focused on how people consume information. Um, and so I'm, I also was a firefighter at the same time that I was a teacher, and then I had the opportunity to become a firefighter full time. Um, and now I'm the training chief in our department. So, um, so I work on organizing and putting together presentations and making sure that our instructors have everything they need. That's my current role. Um, but the presentation itself is kind of that in a nutshell. So we talk about um, how to, what to think about before you put together a presentation, um, the elements of the presentation, and uh, basically all of that, and then all the way up to actually delivering the presentation and um, the things to think about that a lot of times, you're right, we don't get training on that. So um, people forget that it's not really about what you know and what you're telling other people, but it's about how they receive that information and how to best keep it in their brain so they can utilize it um, in that emergency situation. Dave, have you had the opportunity to take Be Becky's class? No, I haven't, but uh, it, it's uh, the, the fact that she's got the background in education, like uh, like our buddy Sam, he's got that background in education. It sounds like it, uh, like you said at the top of the show, it's probably something that everyone should take. We're going to talk about uh, being an instructor. You just don't show up one day and open up a book. There's actually uh, a lot more to teaching than just thinking that you can do it. You, there's techniques and you have to know how to do it. But next year, I will definitely drop into Becky's class. Fingers crossed that it's on the, on the schedule for next year. <laughs> And I, and I think there's a progression for instructors because if you walk into a new instructor's class, they're kind of married to the podium. And right. then as they get more and more comfortable, they tend to get unchained from the podium. What advice do you have to instructors that are trying to make that transition now that are simply married to that podium and have, have problems getting off it? And I like the fact that you're – degree in educational background is in elementary school because that translates really well into the fire service because our attention span is not that long. Uh, do you have any advice for instructors that are at that point in their career where they just became instructors but they don't have the comfort to kind of leave the podium? Right, so um, a big part of it, you know, people that are selected to give a presentation obviously are the best one to give that presentation. They're the ones that have the knowledge. Um, but a lot of times what people do is they open up a presentation and they dump everything they know into the PowerPoint slides. And so they're married to reading the slides or being right next to their computer. Um, and what I try to tell people is it's not about the presentation, really. Um, it's about your story. I mean, you were tapped into to, to give the presentation or to lead the training. Um, and so you already have the knowledge. So the presentation, you know, the PowerPoint that everybody associates with it, really shouldn't have all of your knowledge in it. It should have like cues for you to remember, oh, you know, that's what I was gonna talk about here. I use pictures a lot. I could go through a whole presentation, you know, two, four hours with 50 words or less. Um, and it's all pictures, because most people learn through pictures. Um, and having those cues to remind you and keep you on track of what your story is. But really the big thing is, it's your story. 
you're there to entertain people, whether you like it or not, hands-on training or, or um, in-person training. Um, the whole point is you're telling them your story. You're, you're giving them the knowledge that, uh, that you have. So trying to get off of the fact of, you know, I have to get them this bullet pointed list that I have in front of me or that I have on the presentation. Um, get past that and talk about how people can apply it in their department, how it relates to previous training, um, how you can use it in the real world, and and why it's meaningful to you is kind of those are the big the big milestones really. Yeah, because nobody wants to go to a class and watch an instructor read their slides, but right. yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> it happens all the time. It makes no, it absolutely makes no sense because. The, then the student gets into that mode where all they're doing is reading the slides with right. the instructor. And I think it breaks down the learning process. Dave, you've experienced that, right? Taking a class where they're just reading off their slides, what's it do to you? It's, uh, you kind of get a little bored and you start thinking to yourself, you know, I'm going to be in here for the next hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. You could have just given me your PowerPoint notes and I'd have read that and gotten the same thing out of it and uh, I do like a, an instructor that's dynamic that moves around that uh, has some funny stories and uh, you know we are as firefighters we're blue-collar workers and I like the blue-collar presentation um, that uh, they're right there with us and, and what they're saying and what they're telling us is the most important thing that we need to know right now and uh, I think that's the key if you can get people to buy into what you're saying is the most important thing that they're hearing right now you're going to really feel a lot more relaxed when you're giving your presentation. You'll find yourself kind of moving around the room and, and, and like Becky said, using your bullet points um, as just a memory jogger uh, to, to transition into your next thought. Right. And one of the things that I tap into when I, you talk about reading the slides and, you know, you could have just sent me the slides and I would have, that would have been good enough is um, your brain kind of tricks you into that. So I'll be a student reading the board and I'll read all the bullet points while they're talking about the first one. And then by the time they get to the second one or third one, it's not new information for my brain, even though I've only had that information for five seconds. And as that happens, slide after slide after slide, your brain starts to tune out because you're not acquiring any new information, even though you kind of are. Um, so that's why it's hard to stay attentive in presentations where people do that, where they're just giving you, or reading to you the bullet points because your brain is already tricked and thinks well, this isn't new information and so you start looking at your phone or doing something else or you know talking to your neighbor because you're not acquiring anything new and your brain doesn't feel the need um, on an elementary level doesn't feel the need to stay engaged and some of that is the instructor not having prepared enough to know their slides they almost feel like it's a, a safety net of yep. reading the words when they're actually taking away from their own credibility. Um, if they prepare enough and they have words to key themselves off and they throw a picture in there where no words on it at all, that picture then forces somebody who has that issue. So if you're uh, you know, one of the drill master or director of training in a training academy and you see people doing that, um, try to give them, don't just tell them not to do it, try to give them some suggestions on how not to do it. Go through the program, take out a bunch of your bullet points and replace it with a picture. So it forces you to then talk about the picture. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I mentioned that I use pictures a majority of my slides and the benefit of the pictures, you know, people think, well, I like to have the bullets because then whoever else is giving my slide will have all that information. Well, you can put all that information in the notes section of Keynote or PowerPoint or whatever you're using. Um, but really the best thing about the picture is if a picture pops up there and I don't remember what I was going to say about it and I can't see my bullet points, then I just say whatever I want because nobody in the audience has any clue what that picture is there for. And as long as I say something that relates to the picture, you know, and I'm, I'm somewhat on task, I still look like I'm prepared and know what I'm doing. Now, if I'm just making up random stories for every picture, obviously that'll, you know, that credibility goes away. But that's the other benefit of a picture because we've all been in presentations where somebody's reading the slide and they read a full bullet point that is like a partial sentence and they go, yeah, I don't know what that means. And then they move on. Well, now I'm annoyed because I could maybe make my own, well, that might mean this and how come they don't know that and I know it. So it, it, it's easier to just use the pictures and say whatever, <laughs> say whatever you want in place. And the picture isn't going to key your mind. Get another picture. Yes. Some yes. great photographers out there like uh, Oak from Chicago, anywhere on the internet, 
right. finding quality photographs is not hard anymore. No, it's very easy. The other thing, you have to make sure that you're crediting people because otherwise you are stealing, um, which you don't want to do. And then I would caution people against using bad example pictures, especially deep in their presentation, um, because sometimes people will capture what they see and they might not be paying as much attention to what you're saying. So if you have bad example after bad example after bad example deep in your presentation when people are kind of tuning out and haven't had a break in a while, they're going to start filing away those pictures, but they won't be associated with your words of, yeah, don't do this. They just have the picture file it away. And next time their brain goes rummaging through, they're like, oh, I remember seeing I should do this. Um, and they don't have the, the words tied to it. In New England, it's not stealing. It's called borrowing brilliance. Right? <laughs> yes. so very important. We don't, we don't steal. But yeah, it's easy to give somebody credit yep. for something they do. And we should do that. Now let's talk a little bit, and Dave, you're good at this because I've seen your presentation as well, is when you insert videos, I've been to a couple classes where the instructor puts on like a 20-minute video. Find a video that's cut down or get somebody to cut down the video so the video doesn't take over your lecture. It enhances it. Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about that because you do a good job with that? Yeah, when uh, the – when I first, one of the first uh, FDIC classes I ever took was a four-hour hot program on just learning how to build PowerPoints. And uh, in, in order to use your PowerPoint successfully, you need to know how to take those videos and whittle them down to get the, the, the maximum amount of information out in the shortest amount of time. If you have a 10-minute video, yeah, it's all great stuff, but you're, you're going to lose the audience. If you can do it in a minute, at the most a minute and a half to get your point across, that's uh, that's where you're going to key in. Like you said at the top of the show, you know, we all have minds of elementary school, especially especially the guys, and we're going to lose interest right away. So you got to capture that information, talk about it, and then move on. Um, I like to grab a lot of quick videos. Some of them are kind of funny, and it kind of breaks up the um, the monotony of the actual presentation, and uh, it kind of stops the show a little bit has a little bit of a levity into it, and then we talk about that, and then we move on to the to the next. Uh, um, PowerPoint slide, but I do like using videos because, like Becky said, we learn a lot from our visual cues, especially as firefighters. We learn a lot from what we see as opposed to what we read, and uh, especially when you have a lot of fire pictures up there, that's going to uh, capture the attention a lot more, but you just, you just can't have those videos run too long. Mm -hmm. Becky, is there a recommendation for the instructors on how many videos to put into a presentation? I know when I build a presentation, I try to put like 10 slides in between each short video clip just to break it up. Is there something in the academic world where there's a recommendation or? Um, well, there isn't that I'm aware of. I shouldn't say there isn't at all. Um, it's really funny because in the, in the academic world, there's really not a whole lot of PowerPoint being used, um, especially at the elementary level where I was. I went into the school's um, because I do our prevention stuff as well. And uh, the teachers had no idea even how to open PowerPoint and how to start the first slide, which I thought was entertaining. Um, so there's not, they don't do a whole lot of the canned presentation stuff um, in the, the you know, K-12 um, setup. But, um, you know, it really depends on what the topic is. I just went through uh, PJ Norwood and Sean Gray's fire behavior stuff. We had a six hour class and a four hour class or two hour class. Um, and that was almost every slide had a very short video just to kind of sell the point. Um, visuals are, are huge. If your whole thing is, is disjointed videos, then I would say, yeah, that's a bad idea. Um, but if the videos play into what you're doing or show an example of what you um, are trying to get across in the drill, then absolutely. I don't think there's a limit um, as long as you pay attention to how long they're getting. Um, there's great software out there to edit videos. Um, down to whatever you want. You can, in fact, take videos and edit your own narrative over the top of them. So you can take a video that you want to use as a training tool and then narrate, narrate your points over the top of it so you don't have to yell during a presentation over the top of a video. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. Camtasia is what I use. I, you know, I'm not tied to them in any way, but it's very user-friendly. Um, and I've done that where I've taken a video and then put my narrative over the top of it. Um, and inserted pictures. I kind of created my own little mini video that is nice too because you can use it as a pre-learning tool if you have um, Target Solutions or other software like that. 
What was the name? Considering you're not tied to them, what was the name of the program? Because Camtasia, C A M T A S I A, Camtasia. Now, is it a free application, or do you have to pay for it? Um, the version I have, you have to pay for. I think they have like a 30-day trial free. Um, it was something that I got off of Modern Fire Instructor, which is uh, Frank Lipsky's um, website. He does a lot on on how to integrate technology into firefighter training. Um, so that was one. It was a recommendation I got from him, actually. Now you talked about putting your story forward. Another mistake that I see a lot of instructors make, especially when they get to the national level, is they think people care about how many engines and how many trucks went to the fire that they're talking about. It's not relevant to the story they're telling, unless you're telling a story about coordinating tactics and you're kind of diagramming what everybody's doing. If you're telling a personal story or an injury story, I see, a lot, I see it in articles too where they run through this full list of this company went to the box, this company went to the box, but it doesn't really add or take away any, I think it takes away something from the story. Dave, have you experienced that where the story just gets too long and the point gets lost with all this other information that isn't really relevant to the student? I think that, uh, you know, I try not to, when, I, when I'm doing an incident command, um, we keep it simple. We don't talk, you know, I talk about stories or, or, or um, incidents that I ran, you know, I said, you know, we were a four alarm fire, but I don't break, break down what a four alarm fire is because quite frankly, they don't care. Um, you know, th to get the point across, it was a four alarm fire. We had a, quite a bit of fire and it moved from there. Um, I have been at presentations where, uh, you know, they talk about the amount of equipment that may have been on the scene, but moreover in a negative way about, well, this company didn't do what they were supposed to do. And I'm, I'm a, I really am turned off by instructors that want to bash other people's tactics or other calls that have been run when you're kind of Monday morning quarterbacking. So, uh, like you said, if it doesn't give any merit to your presentation, don't put it in there. Becky, you talk about in your program about the background of your slides. You want to kind of add to that for us? Yeah, we talk um, a, a lot about kind of layout and one of the background where one of the things, elements, is the background color. A lot of people have gone to having a dark background um, and white words because it pops out, which is true. Um, it actually was came about from, um, from um, marketing. So different companies want you to spend more time on their product. It takes your brain, you know, milliseconds, but still longer to process um, white writing on black backgrounds or dark backgrounds. And so these advertisers wanted to pull people in by having them spend a little bit more time processing their product, um, which is how the whole dark light on dark came to be. Um, in presentations, there's a place for it. I don't use it. I use a lot of white, and I use my colors and my fonts, you know, um, blue especially. Um, there's this is actually research out there that people see blue text on white writing better than any other combination, um, even more than black on white for some reason. Um, but if you have the dark background and the light writing, or a gradient background even, and a light writing, um, it takes the brain a little bit more to process. And so slide after slide, if you have a long program, your brain is getting more and more tired throughout the presentation. Um, and, and it's harder to stay attentive um, to what's, be, what's up there, especially if you're reading, give a lot of words up there. Um, if you have a black or dark background and a lot of pictures, um, that your brain doesn't have to spend time processing those words. There's no words there for them to process, for your brain to process. So, um, so I'm not against black backgrounds. I personally don't use them. Um, but just know the longer your presentation, the less you want to use that kind of a setup. Something that I found about using the black background with, uh, with colored words is that if the people in your classroom are straight on, they can see it real clearly. But if they're on the side, they tend to lose something from the presentation because that was the first background I used. And when I taught in Hawaii, I looked at the evaluations and some said it was a great PowerPoint and others said it was horrible. And right. I think it had to do with where they were sitting in the room. So now Jason Emery, who's phenomenal at PowerPoint, um, he made a background for me and it's like a light gray smoke, but it's got dark red at the bottom and the top. 
and then you use white lettering on the top and dark lettering on the slide, and that seems to work really well. So I agree with you. I think if you get a lighter background, it uh, it stands out more and looks more professional. Right. And the, the type of font that you use plays into that as well. Um, people, for some reason, our brains have defaulted to Times New Roman, um, which was the default for when they printed paper, it used the least amount of ink. Um, so that's how that came to be the default. Well, obviously, that's not a problem for us anymore. I mean, obviously, we don't want to use a lot of ink, but on a presentation, it's not an issue. Um, so you'll notice now that PowerPoint and Keynote will default to Calibri or um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones, um, Arial. Um, those are the perfect ones to use because they don't have little legs on the letters, um, little tails. Serif, the Latin, sans serif. Um, you're looking for no tails because um, those tails actually take your brain a while to process as well. So if you have a basic font and a nice light, lighter background, um, you'll end up having people retain that information a lot better. Okay, what are the two fonts that you recommend? Um, I'm gonna grab, I have the whole list here actually because I pulled up my presentation just semi-nervous that you would actually reference it. So hang on a second. Um, <laughs> no, but this is good stuff because I don't think a lot of instructors think about their font. And sometimes it's the little details that just get you over the next little hump. Right, so Arial, Calibri, Calibri is my favorite. Um, uh, Lucida, Microsoft Sans, Serif, Tahoma, Veranda, a lot of those, anything that doesn't have the little tails on them. Like if you think about Times, most people can picture Times, New Roman in their head. It's got the T with the little edges on the, the sides and the little edges on the bottom of the T. Um, you know, has those little tails on it. So the, that the tails are what you're trying to avoid. So um, Times and Palantino and all of those ones that have the little tails on them. You're trying to stay away from those, and you definitely want to stay away from all the what they call fancy fonts, like the handwriting fonts and the old English. You know, all sorts of extra calligraphy stuff. Um, your brain goes gets really tired looking at that stuff too much. See, Dave, I just try to spell the words wrong in my presentation. That way they're not looking at the tails on the font and it's right. right to the spelling. It's if you lose all credibility, it's no, no worry. <laughs> it's funny. When I took my PowerPoint class uh, back, you know, back when FDIC was in Cincinnati, I'm showing my age, um, I've always used a lighter blue background with a yellow font or the color yellow, and then I use the uh, Tahoma. I've always used Tahoma, and uh, it works for me. It doesn't. I've noticed that red on blue looks kind of weird, but uh, the yellow kind of pops, and uh, you can see it from all angles of the room. Becky. <laughs> so is, does Tatoma have uh, tails? Nope, that's a good one. That's Sansory. That's without tails. So that's a good one. See, so you're Becky approved, Dave. <laughs> well, I must be doing something right. Let me mark that down. You're doing well. and. You know, I made a joke about spelling, and I'm famous for spelling slides wrong, but I set the expectation at the beginning of every class. I tell them that I hit a couple misspelled words. In the first one, you get a free T-shirt, and the second one, you can get the hell out. So um, <laughs> it tends to work, setting expectations, but have somebody look over your slides. Becky, kind of go over the importance of having somebody proofread, because the key to, and that goes for an article too, the key to, Good writing is rewriting, so the key to good spelling is proofreading, correct? Right. So that's a great point that you bring up. A lot of people would, ne you know, you'd never publish an article or a blog or whatever you're doing without having somebody edit it, um, but people don't think about that with presentations. They just put it together and then throw it up, and really it is the same thing. You know, you're putting together a lot of information. I have people look over my presentations all the time um, as well because you're, when you get married to what you've put in there, you don't see the problems, much like in articles. You know, somebody will pull something out, and you're like, yeah, no, I didn't even notice I used that word twice or, you know, whatever the issue is. Um, the same thing happens in presentations. And so having somebody else look at it with a different perspective than what you have um, is a good idea. The problem is that people get really passionate about their slides. So when somebody sends me their slides, I have to verify, do you really want me to be honest about this? Or... <laughs> Do you, you know, just do, do you want one or two things or do you want everything? Um, I have some friends that will bring their whole presentation and set it down in front of me and I'll write all over all of it, you know, and here's things to think about. And, um, but again, that's what they're asking me to do. So I'm editing. 
Um, and then I have others that, you know, I'll give one or two suggestions like, you know, check your titles because some slides you have them all capitalized, some slides you have it all lowercase, um, just consistency or, hey, you have three periods on one slide and one period on the other slide and because that kind of stuff drives me crazy as an elementary teacher. That's the stuff I notice. Um, so having somebody else look at it is good, but make sure it's that it's somebody that you won't um, get upset with if they're honest with you because um, I've, I've had some people take offense to me redlining their, I don't use red by the way, but, but redlining their uh, presentation. Um, but really it's all in an effort to make somebody look, look great, right? My, that's my goal when I'm helping somebody with their articles or with their presentations is I want them to look super smart and, you know, be the best that they can be up there. So. Well, if you're a firefighter, you got to be able to take criticism. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> part of the, part of the job. Would you agree, Dave? Yeah, I, uh, I was fortunate that I married up in life and, and my wife is a, uh, she's an English major, but she's also a nurse and uh, I always give her my, any memos, presentations, anything I've ever written. I just hand it to her and say, make me look smart. And uh, she does a good job. She does a good job with that. Becky, is there any rules on, um, like on some of my slides, I like to capitalize the main words and not capitalize the other words. Now, I don't use a lot of words in my program, but um, if I got like three bullet points and I want it to stand out, is there any, uh, is there any science to that? Uh, well, it depends on who's in your audience. For people like me who know what proper nouns are and get really irritated when people make their own proper nouns. Um, it's probably not a good idea, but um, you know, I find that a lot. If you go to a presentation on um, truck company ops, they'll have ventilation capitalized, they'll have ladders capitalized, you know, the things that really, th that are important to them, people tend to capitalize them. Um, I guess I'd rather see that than all caps, the whole word, that's just kind of annoying. Um, but to me, as you know, an elementary, former elementary teacher, uh, prone, uh, proper nouns, you know, specific people, places, or things are the only things that should be capitalized. Um, so I avoid that, but, uh, or just use single words as a placeholder in your brain. So having just ventilation, you can have it capitalized if it's a single word. So, Dave, what do you do with your slides? Do you have a set way of doing it, or you every slide's different? Um, I try to, you know, most of my slides have a title, uh, to them, uh, lets me know what I'm, what I'm transitioning into. It's usually the first word is capitalized and then bullet points. My bullet points are capitalized, um, just the beginnings of the words. And then like, like Becky said, your, your proper nouns. Um, I try not to get too wrapped up in, um, in, uh, the, the English and, and, and the, you know, but more of just making sure of it. I've got, it's probably not even going to be a complete sentence, just a bullet point in order to uh, jog my memory so I can move on to transition onto the next thought. Right. Try to avoid sentences in slides if you can. We're at the middle of our show. I just want to thank Tenkata Fabrics for all they do to keep firefighters safe. Their gear, the fabrics they put forward, uh, you find in gear, whether it's Globe, Morning Pride, the whole entire gambit has Tenkatic fabrics in it. But the other nice thing about Tenkata, and I stopped by their booth at FDIC, is if you are buying gear, and we all know when you're buying gear or specking gear out, when you're talking to the gear company, their gear is always the best. So by going to the fabric company, you can actually allow them to help you do your risk and benefit analysis and your PPE analysis, and they'll help walk you through the process as well. So you kind of get a, an independent um, set of eyes on it, which is always good to do. So once again, I'd like to thank uh, Tinkata Fabrics. Becky, you talked about picture placement in on the slides, right versus left placement, size, etc. You want to kind of elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, because I use a lot of pictures, they move around. Um, obviously, you want them as large as you can have them on your slide. Um, but if you're if you're using a picture to kind of add to what's on the slide, you want to have it over on the, as you're looking at it over on the right side. Um, and, and if you want it to be kind of the focal point and you're going to have words and pictures, put it over on the left side. The reason for that is, so our brains work like the old fashioned typewriter. 
Um, so hopefully people can picture what the old-fashioned typewriters are. But you typed, and then a little bell would go off, and then you go to the next line. Now, you know, obviously our computers do that for us, but your brain goes all the way across, and then when it gets here, it starts back over and goes all the way across. So if I have a picture over here, my brain will hit the picture, and then it's already processed that picture, so then it'll just go up to the picture in the future. Um, if I put the picture over here, your brain actually goes picture, words, picture, words, picture, words, because it has to keep processing what's over on that side every time when it starts. So if you really want them to focus on the picture, put it on the left so that their brain resets on that picture every line. Um, if it just is adding to what you had to say, put it on the right, and then they'll see it once, finish what they're looking at, and then they'll focus on it after. Dave, you never thought there was so much to a presentation, huh? It's funny because, uh, you know, using Keynote, it, it kind of does that for you. You know, you can take a look at all the slides. You know, you have, you have your presentation kind of built in your head and what you want it to look like. And uh, you can actually pick, pick the different slides uh, that you want to put on, on how you want, want it set up. You want, like uh, Becky said, the words to be the focal point or you want the picture to be the focal point. And the best thing about Keynote is that it lines everything up nice and straight with crosshair, so nothing's crooked. Everything is lined up one underneath of the other. So uh, there is a lot to it, but uh, you, you, know, you just don't think about it that much. Or I don't think about it as in depth like that. If you're, Dave, if you're all squared away with PowerPoint, and I'm using a Mac here today, but I haven't ventured into Keynote. Is it hard to make that that translation, that jump between one or the other? It's it's very similar. And if you are good with PowerPoint, you should be able to pick up Keynote pretty quick. I did a couple of uh, short presentations just to get used to how it works. But you're always kind of finding uh, new things about it. But it, when you first start using Keynote, it actually uh, it runs you through as you touch things. It gives you little uh, uh, balloons that pop up and tell you what what it is and how to do things. Um, it's really not a difficult program to use. It's it's uh, it's almost like a WYSIWYG type of program. Is what you see is what you get, and it uh, it, it helps you uh, build it. And it's, they have lots of of backgrounds to choose from. You can make your own master slides. They have lots of uh, uh, picture backgrounds. I mean, everything in the library that you could think of is there for you. And and it depends on the type of presentation that you want to do. It can help you set it up. Becky, what platform do you use when you're building something? Are you using PowerPoint or Keynote? So I use PowerPoint for stuff that um, pe I want to share with other people just because it's an easy platform to share. I, I think Keynote's a better platform. I'm not an Apple guy. Um, I, I, don't, I just don't like the way it lays out, which is funny because I know everybody else prefers Apple. My brain doesn't work that way. Um, but I actually use Prezi a lot, um, which is a web-based uh, service platform. Um, and it's that's more of a mind map. So you get your whole screen. They give you kind of a they give you templates, but I start with a blank screen. They give you a whole screen, and then you kind of place your stuff in there. It'll download um, PowerPoint. I'm assuming it would download Keynote, and then you can just put it all out. So your whole presentation will be on the screen, and it zooms into the different parts. Um, you kind of have to know what you're doing because you can make your audience sick as it's zooming around if you don't know what you're doing because it'll spin and get people seasick. Um, but once you get all that dialed in, um, it's great because instead of just flipping from side to side uh, or slide to slide, it will transition. And so your brain cues back in as an audience member for that transition because you're leaving the slide that you're on. You see it exit and then a new slide will be there. It's the, the transitions um, really, I like it. It helps pe keep people um, attentive in the audience, um, but it's a little bit different to use if you're not used to it. Um, it's pretty intuitive, um, but it's hard to share. So if somebody doesn't have Prezi, you can't just download your Prezi and send it to somebody. You can send them a link to it, um, but they can't you know, grab certain portions of it. Uh, the ones that I build in Prezi, I can't take the pictures back. I can't take the videos back. I have to try and recreate them. Um, so a lot of times I'll create it in PowerPoint and then upload it to Prezi so that I still have the PowerPoint as a tool. Because I usually give all my stuff away. If people ask for it, I'll give a PDF of my presentation. Um, it's just stuff I've collected over the years, so it's not like I'm you know, creating new material. It's, it's just, you know, it's my collection of, of resources, so I'm happy to share that with people, and Prezi's not the best platform for sharing it, so. 
And the the flying in and out doesn't make people nauseated. Well, yeah, that's the that's the thing. You have to make sure that you do it um, the right way. Um, I I've done some where we're you know doing map reading in our department because our our city is laid out um, in an interesting way. Uh, it started out as farm farm plats that were sold and then they developed the whole neighborhood. So it's really convoluted to get around in our city. And so we do a lot of map reading stuff, um, probably more so than gridded cities do. And I had the presentation laid out on a big map. And so it went from, you know, when we talked about a neighborhood, it would like zoom into the map in that neighborhood. And then we talk about whatever we were talking about and then it'd zoom out. And, um, and you, you have to either insert a lot of talking in between the zooms or you have to make the zooms pretty um, minor, otherwise you will get people that are, you know, that have to close their eyes every time you transition the slide. So, now you talk in your program about personal space, smile, gesturing, eye contact. Right. You uh, hit some of those things. Personal space, I love because the person who mastered that is Anthony Castro's because he's always rubbing somebody's head. So um, I don't know if that violates the personal space rule. However. I was teaching in Portland a couple, I don't know, a month and a half ago, Maine, and uh, there was a bald-headed gentleman in the front row, and during the class, I just started rubbing his head, and it went over really well. So, <laughs> Did it go over really well with him, though? It did. He, uh, I think he truly enjoyed the experience. <laughs> I mean, it's quite interesting, because I've seen Anthony pull it off so many times, I said, that's probably a good way of getting hit, but... Uh, I don't know. He he makes it fun, but uh, you want to respect people's personal space, correct? Right. Yeah. I don't think I could get away with coming up and I, yeah, I can't even imagine doing that though. It'd be awkward for everyone. Um, <laughs> usually, what I talk about in the presentation is, you know, um, and I don't know if it's the same there, but in the Midwest, we tend to fill up the back of the room first. It's kind of a church thing. I think everybody wants to stay as far away as possible. Um, mm -hmm. So the back of the room would be filled up. So you want to move as the presenter within four feet of whoever your first row of people is. Um, it's really awkward if the whole back of the room fills up and there's one person sitting up front because then you either have to get behind them or they're really the only person you're tied to. Um, but what I talk about is the audience really is a blob. And so if I'm within um, a decent personal space um, called kind of the friend zone or or audience zone, four feet to 10 feet, um, then the people even in the back row feel connected to me as a presenter. Uh, you have to watch, especially it depends on your audience, but how much you walk around. It's okay to walk around in the front of the room because people can still see you. But once you walk down the middle aisle, um, people have to turn around to look at you. And depending on your audience, you have to think about mobility issues. You have to think about lip reading. Um, there's a fair amount of people that as um, as they get older, they uh, focus more on lip reading than they than they do actually listening, and you don't realize it until you can't see the lips anymore. Um, but you want to make sure that you have that roughly four feet. Now, if my the back of my room filled up and I have four rows of empty seats, and then I'm at the very front, the whole audience is disengaged from me as a presenter and feel disconnected and will tune out faster. So you want to stay in that four feet zone. If you get closer than a foot or a foot and a half, then everybody gets uncomfortable. It's much that same blob thing. So I'm thinking the head rubbing is in that <laughs> intimate zone, but but I don't know. If you can pull it off, more power to you. Like I said, that's an Anthony Cash. The, <laughs> the master at that. You're the Heisman on that one now, aren't you? <laughs> Something uh, Dave does in his class that I like in a classroom, and somebody else did it with, they actually stretched a line in a classroom at FDIC this year, which I thought was pretty good. But uh, Dave gets portable radios in everybody's hand at some point in one of his classes and lets them give a size up over the radio. So it takes kind of a, a classroom setting and makes it into a hands-on setting, but it breaks things up. Dave, can you talk about that? Because when you do that, I think it comes across real effectively. Yeah, when uh, my last presentation that I did last year was, was the Aaron 45 Minutes, whatever presentation, uh, for my command level class and, or command ops class and I found that I was rushing through it. Um, I've recently made it into four hours and uh, it's actually a hot class now. But um, we start off with uh, talking about, you know, giving your initial on-scene reports and uh, I kind of break down what most chief officers are looking for, listening to hear on the radio, 
um, of, of what the first end company has and how to give the maximum amount of information with the least amount of talking on the radio. Um, and we, we will go over in the PowerPoint, we'll go over what an on-scene report should sound like and what it looks like. And then we give um, radios. We have a couple of radios. I'll put one in the front of the classroom, turn it on, and then give it to give one radio. We'll pass around the classroom, and I'll just go through a series of fire porn pictures and uh, let people uh, give uh, initial on scene reports. And I, and I stress to them, obviously, don't do it my way. Do it the way you would do it in your home department because I'm not trying to change what you do. I'm just trying to make you more aware of what you're doing. And then when we move forward, when we actually start to go into command commanding incidents, I use a simulation program um, that I run through the uh, projector, and they uh, you'll hear uh, my buddy Sam, he'll do all the dispatching, and he'll be four different companies and two trucks on a rescue squad, and he'll do all the talking from another room, and they'll the command officer will arrive on the scene and actually command the fire. We'll give them like five to seven minutes, and they'll command the initial stages of the fire with that radio feedback and uh, it keeps people moving and uh, haven't had anybody say that it, it was a terrible experience and I usually have people that want to come up and try it. So, so far so good. It's a set. It's a set. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's great. Um, one other thing that you kind of keyed my mind on that I saw at FDIC this year and I actually talked to the instructor about it afterwards and um, he was very well received to it is for the hour and 45 minute classes at FDIC, a lot of individuals are taking a four-hour class and they're putting it into an hour and 45 minutes or they're taking a three-hour class. But then when you take their class, the, the students are there to see you. If I go to Becky White's class, I'm there to see Becky White and I want to learn from her. And I find it off-putting when the instructor starts and says, well, this is a four-hour class and I'm trying to cram all this in, so I'm going to move fast. It kind of just, I don't know, it sets up like a negative in the beginning of the class. They don't, they're there for an hour and 45 minutes. They came there to see you. Just start your program and finish your program, but don't set a negative expectation from the beginning of, I got to cram all this in. Becky, can you, uh, can you speak to that? Um, that's a great point. Um, that along with self-deprecation, that's another thing the firefighters, we tend to do, well, people a lot smarter than me, blah, 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 you know, and then they'll go into the, what they have to say. And it, it aggravates me on a personal level, but really you're telling the audience, I'm not the person you should be listening to. When, <laughs> as soon as you say that, as soon as you say, well, you know, people smarter than me have decided that this is the way it's going to be, or people that, that are smarter than me have known this, or I'm just a firefighter. Or I'm just, you know, I've just, that, the word just kind of drives me crazy in our, in our industry as well. Um, Cause you hear it at all levels. I'm just a firefighter. I'm just a Lieutenant. I'm just a, I'm just a chief. Um, there's no just anything. We, I mean, we all, everybody contributes an equal amount at their different level or we wouldn't function. Um, but yeah, the self-deprecation and the, the negatives of, you know, I'm trying to cram this in and, and I don't have enough time to tell you what I need to tell you. It's really, it is really frustrating and it's a, it's a very negative tone. Um, so and you can turn that around. You can do the same thing. Like this is normally a four hour presentation and I'm really excited to try to get all of that information to you guys in the next hour and 45 minutes. That's an entirely different statement than I'm trying to cram it in and I don't think we're going to be able to do it, but let's go. You know, it's, it, it sets you up for, Oh yeah, I'm going to learn four hours worth of stuff in the next hour and 45 minutes. If they say it in a positive way versus, Oh, well, great. I'm missing half of the content. I mean, you know, that's how you receive either of those comments. I, I agree with you hundred percent, but one thing on the self deprecation part of it, in the context that you put it in, I completely agree with you. But one of the best things that you can do that I find, and I made a career of telling everybody every time I make a mistake, that's like a next article for me. But one of the things that you can do, especially when you're teaching at a level of FDIC and you're doing tactics or something, I mean, just follow me around with a camera for a week and you'll find me doing something stupid. Right. It, to point out that you are human and if you can tell a short story about a mistake you made, it actually, I think it engages the students. It's different from the self-deprecation that you're talking about, but you have to have a way to humanize you because if you just go up there and you're like, oh, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, it, it doesn't work. They'll see right through you because, you know, on this job, it's kind of how you recover. Dave, you want to speak to that? 
Yeah, it's uh, to to go back what what uh, you were saying earlier about trying to cram uh, all that information in a short amount of time. When when I wrote that that command ops program, I wrote it for FDIC as an hour and forty five minutes, and realized when the class was over, I was like, "Well, I still got another two hours of, of stuff I could have done." And, uh, you know, so I, I never made those statements, but uh, we've actually stretched this class out. We just did it in Harrisburg uh, for four hours, and uh, I didn't think I could talk for four hours. I didn't think I knew four hours worth of stuff to talk about, but, uh, you know, it was well-received. But um, definitely uh, I, I like to tell people stories that uh, – things that have happened to me that, you know, how I'm not perfect, but the fact that I learned from this – um, and it'll never happen again uh, is the type of story that I think people like to hear. It's like, hey, you know what? Here's here's a battalion chief from from uh, you know right outside of Washington D.C. They run a lot of calls, and and he's not perfect, you know. So maybe it's okay to make mistakes as long as you learn from them. And if you if you tell the story in that particular way, that this is the mistake that I made. I always go back. I listen to the radio transmissions, and I found that I did actually make that mistake. And I move forward from it. I learn from it. And then I share that with everybody. As I don't beat myself up about it. And, you know, I, I think that uh, when you humanize yourself, that, that uh, you know, you're, you're, this job, you're always learning. And the moment you say you're not learning anymore, it's time to move on from the job. Becky, there's something I learned uh, about giving presentations at FDIC. And I learned it from – I'm going to mispronounce his last name, so I apologize. But I believe it's Kirsch. Jim Kirsch, he's from uh, New Jersey. He took my class and he said, somebody gave him this tip years ago and it's always worked for him and I instituted it and I find that it works in almost anything is that if you go to one of my classes at FDIC, you'll usually find me right outside the door and I shake everybody's hand as they come in. Now, usually it's because I'm hungover and I'm looking for the first person who drinks just a straight black coffee with nothing in it because I usually steal it. But uh, I find that it's a way to connect with everybody. And if you got to do something with your presentation or you're doing something with the volume and people come in and they're sitting in, I try to go around the room and shake everybody's hand before I start or at least, you know, a good portion of the group. And I find it's a way that you connect a lot better uh, with the people. I think that was great advice I got back in the day. Becky, you want to weigh in on that? Um, yeah, I talk about being really the flight attendant for your presentation. I mean, when you're, when you're, get on a plane, they greet you, and then they point out, you know, like if something happens, here's how we're going to react, here's where the bathrooms are, I hope you're all very comfortable. Um, and then they're there at the end, you know, saying thank you and goodbye. So I talk about that as you're giving a presentation, especially at a level of FDIC. I don't go to the doors um, because there, there's usually multiple doors, but I've put myself kind of in the entryway and I greet people as they come in. Um, I don't block them, you know, I'll stand midway up and you know, how is it going? Are you enjoying FDIC? I try not to focus on, uh, it's just conversational. It's like elevator talk, you know, how, how's your conference going? What have you taken so far? That's been good. What, you know, what are you looking forward to bringing back and, um, try to just have a general conversation with someone. Um, but really you are the, the, uh, flight attendant to your presentation. And that's kind of a way that I always try to remind people to think about it. And as an instructor, you got to have confidence in your subject. Okay? Yep. Spend the time to, if you're, I'll tell you right now, when I get the presentations, and Becky, you may, you, I think you do as well, when I get the presentations and they say, I've never, for call for submissions for FDIC, and they check the box that says, I've never presented this anywhere before. To me, that's like, I'm going to go to the World Series without playing a playoff game. Right. <laughs> Anybody I know worth their salt when you're putting in a presentation, I'll take Justin McCarthy, for example. He was doing a Mayday pr presentation. As soon as he put it together for FDIC, he went and taught that program to probably eight different departments in Connecticut. And his program that he put together for FDIC, it got better with each department he went to. So he went there to kind of test it out, try it out. So I think it's important that when you're putting that presentation forward, try to try it out on some smaller audiences before you get to the show. Uh, Dave, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, that's uh, when I built the uh, my truck class. You know, I've got a trucks class. I've got the um, a rapid intervention class, and then this command class that we have. And, and uh, with, uh, working with RJ doing the forcible entry stuff, 
we've taught, you know, up and down. We, of course, our first couple of shows were, were in Connecticut because, you know, that's where RJ was from. And, uh, you know, we had the, the pleasure of actually teaching down there in New Haven with you guys uh, at your training academy. So we, we hit the local scene, I guess, you know, I, I used to be in a band when I was young. So you just didn't go and play the Cap Center or the Verizon Center or Hammer Jacks. You know, you had to go put your dues in in the, in the small clubs. And that's kind of what we did is, is – uh, you know, we hit a lot of departments. We did a lot of stuff for free. Uh, we had a lot of free symposiums, and we kind of honed our craft. So when it came time to let's go to FDIC and let's get this word out there, and uh, we were very smooth given the information. We weren't stutter, stumbling over our words. It was it, it came across that we had been talking about this for years that we knew what we were talking about. Becky, you want to weigh in on that? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a huge point. People get really discouraged that they don't get picked for FDIC. Um, well, I've submitted twice or I've submit, I submitted and they didn't want me. Um, it's really frustrating when I ask them, well, have you presented it anywhere else before? Well, no. Like, well, <laughs> you, you know, it is that. It's the World Series. So you, you wouldn't imagine, um, you know, the examples you gave with, with sports or, or music or anything like that. You wouldn't imagine getting up and giving it. And um, the presentation even that I gave at FDIC um, four years ago, uh, the one you went to, that isn't the same one that I gave now because I've given it, you know, another dozen times in between and it changes every time based on, um, on what's going on. In fact, I don't even really have the same presentation when FDIC starts as to when I present. You saw me that morning changing everything in my presentation because I went to three or four presentations while I was there and I'm like, okay, here's things I'm seeing people today doing wrong or doing that maybe need to be addressed. And, and, you know, maybe these other things that I have in there aren't happening anymore. So let me, let me move this stuff around and take this out, make it more relevant. Um, but it's that way in any presentation, you gain confidence, um, on, on what you're talking about. You gain that fluid, um, that fluid ability to talk, uh, which I'm not doing right now very well. Um, the more you present it and it just seems like you are up there telling your story. So if you can't submit at that level of confidence, you need to be looking at state schools or regional schools or, um, or your neighboring department, you know, around here. I don't know if it's the same everywhere. I'm assuming it is, but you know, 50 miles on a briefcase makes you an expert. So as long as you're not presenting in your own department, um, you can go over a couple departments and, and try it out and, uh, enhance what you know those that department's doing with your knowledge and 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 that just enhances the uh the proposal which by the way proposals are due at june 23rd um so people that are interested in that um the other thing too i would suggest on people that are putting their presentation proposals together is when it asks about your bio um tell them about the part of your bio that relates to the presentation that you're giving um, cause there's a lot of times people put in for, let's say presenting and they tell in their bio about how they're a hazmat tech and they have all this specialized rescue experience and, and that's great, but that has nothing to do with what you're presenting on. So, so I see a disconnect there and I might not move that presentation forward. So, um, just having people gaining the confidence on the presentation and, and that needs to come through in the proposal, but then also in your bio, I mean, understand what you bring to the table. And I think that people have to understand too. And the first time I put in for FDIC, I didn't get it. But then there's other individuals who teach and then they get knocked out and then they come back again. It's not a reflection on the individual. A lot of times it's a reflection of how, how the conference is setting up. Do you have six people putting in for the same topic? They could all be great instructors, but you can only have so many topics. And then FDIC tries to put in 10% of individuals that never taught at FDIC before, which I think is brilliant because it keeps the conference fresh and it keeps, it kind of builds the future. It's a way to mentor people coming up. So I think that that's important. So please put in for it. The other thing that I hear a lot of is, and Joey Birch told who teaches flashover at FDIC, the hot class, said it to me one day. I said, why don't you ever write an article about flashover? He says, because it's all been written. And I'm like, He's like, oh, Vinny Dunn did this. But there's new people coming into the fire service every day. And while the more things change, the more they stay the same, the fact is he does have a unique perspective. He's taught me several things. When I was one of the, his instructors out there, he taught me several things that I teach to my recruits to this very day that I bring up in my classes. So, so 
you know, and I think you said it uh, really well earlier, Becky, was that everybody has value in their niche. And, you know, we encourage people to write. Um, Dave's been doing a great job getting the word out on the training community and on Twitter. So there's a lot of different ways, but if you're active on the training uh, community and you're active in the Google Hangouts and the radio shows, that's going to help get you your leg up um, for evaluating. And I'd like to announce today, uh, Dave has agreed to be uh, my new partner for Politics and Tactics, our fire engineering radio show. So it's going to be the the Dave Polykoff and Frank Ritchie uh, show. So I'm excited to have him on. I'm still wishing all the best to my past co-host, uh, Chris Pepler, who is still dealing with some medical issues, and hopefully he'll be back soon. But he's he's got a long struggle ahead of him. So Dave's going to step up and uh, help out. So Dave, uh, thank you for that. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's uh, pretty pretty overwhelming. It's it's uh, I've enjoyed doing your show. We never talk about politics, but uh, we always yeah. talking about tactics. And I think having two conservatives, there's not much to talk about. Politics. <laughs> <laughs> Becky, you gotta love that. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> we're, we're having our first New Haven's having um, a talk about presentations. Um, remember, people don't know what you s very rarely do they remember like everything you say. Think about to the last political speech or the best presentation you've been to. You remember a couple things, but what you really take away is how that person made you feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike Envoy did a good job in his keynote speech saying, you'll never hear somebody from the public say, well, that guy really knows how to use a chainsaw or they, they did a good job taking that hydrant. They remember how they're treated. So mm -hmm. as an instructor, make sure you treat your uh, students the right way. Make sure you take the time to prepare. Make sure you give your class to not just people that you're familiar with. It's just like preparing for a promotional exam. The guys that get in that tight study group and they only study with their friends, they tend to fall flat when they go to the actual panel because they get so comfortable doing the mock orals or they get so comfortable to just doing their shift is that when they go out and they're challenged a little, they kind of fall apart. So to get that confidence, you want to be able to take your presentation to someone like Becky who's going to take out her big red crayon and not give you the star and tear it up. That's how we get better. They tear you up. You can put yourself back together. Um, one thing that Jason Emery taught me about PowerPoint, and I shared it with Becky, and I think she she did it in her sure, class. Group, yep. This is a good this is a good way to finish. And it came about uh, the first class I taught at FDIC. I finished right on time. I had every slide timed out, and then, but I was nervous about it. So then I went to Anthony Avila and I said, "How do you always finish on time?" And he says, oh, I just overbuild my presentation. And my presentation, I could probably talk for three hours. And I just end wherever it ends. And I just kind of sum it up. And I was like, oh, that's brilliant. You can never run out of slides that way. So I started doing that. And then Jason Emery took it to the next level. And he, Becky, why don't you share it? Well, you shared it with me that morning. And actually, it was funny because I stuck the slide in. Um, you know, with pictures of the keyboard and stuff. And then that was the last slide I had. I actually had people waiting outside. Um, Rob, Rob Fisher's class was after me, and I think he had been pacing in the hallway for 15 minutes prior to me finishing, um, which I felt terrible about. But uh, I just walked over and, and did what you said, which I'll share in a minute, and happened to end my slide on that, or my show on that slide. And I still had 25 slides left after that. But um, really what, what was passed on to me is, find out what your last slide was. And we had practiced with my, my intro slide that I think it was slide number three. And I actually had forgotten what number my last slide was, was like 157 or something, but I remembered number three. So you walk over to the computer and you type in whatever that slide number is. So 157 enter or three in this case is what I did three enter. And it brings the presentation back to that slide. Um, I know that works in PowerPoint. I don't know if it works in keynote, but it was perfect because I, I did that last slide of, oh, here's how it works. And I went over and did it. And I said, thanks for coming. And everybody's like, oh, that's great. They had no idea that I missed really two sections of my presentation I hadn't even gotten to yet. And it really sums it up. So you can go back to the last slide that has your contact information on it. Um, you could also, some people now I know, build in three slides or four slides at the end right after it. Because so if you go to 
say if you're at the end of your presentation and you hit three, enter, it goes to three, and then you can go to the next three slides. So if you want to do it like that, ideally pick a slide that's way off in your presentation. So if you got 150 slides, do 200, 201, uh, 201 to 203. You just click in 200, enter, it'll go to that 200. That could be the overview of your program. You proceed to the next slide and that could be your contact information. And it looks like you finish perfectly every single time. And Jason Emery told me that, I wanna say five years ago, and yet still most people don't know that and i see instructors all the time panicking in fdic on whether they're going to be too short or go over this this is perfect it's take anthony avillo's idea build it bigger than it has to be and then later in your program add in a couple slides that you can just go to by putting in the number nobody will even know you're putting in the number right and it's so much better than walking up and going click 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 and showing everybody, hey, I haven't done any of these slides because then you're back to that negative feeling of, hey, I just missed all that stuff. Um, whereas you walk up and do 157 and that 157 happens to be your summary slide and you do 157, 158, 159 has your closing and you say thank you and it all works out perfectly. Dave, did you know that? I uh, I didn't know that, but what I usually do, I put like, um, we call them, uh, I guess, hot buttons or whatever. And usually what I'll do is when I get close to the middle or the end of my presentation i usually make make a period and make it a hyperlink and all i got to do is just run my little i have a thumb mouse uh that i just touch that little hyperlink and it takes me right to whatever slide i want it to go so you can't see it but i know it's there i know where it is and it kind of does the same thing so it's a different way of doing it we're at the witching hour at two o'clock i want to thank becky white for coming on our google hangout today you were a great guest um if you're watching the show we thank tinkata fabrics but also Put in for FDIC. Uh, look for Dave and I on politics and tactics, and all the best to Chris Pepler, uh, Bobby Halton, and everybody else out there. Um, Fire Engineering, we thank you, and uh, have a great day. Thanks. Thanks.